Hello and welcome to episode 414 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert, as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome to Why Are You Laughing? I, I'm, I'm laughing because we're in a slightly different setup. So if you've been following us on social media this week, you'll know that Andy has a lot of new toys that we've, we've basically built a new studio in Money to the Masses Towers and it means that we can do a lot more video uh, we can record the podcast finally we actually asked you on Instagram should we record the Money to the Masses podcast and put it out on YouTube and you overwhelmingly said yes I mean, we were going to do it anyway but what we're going to do is start putting out parts of the podcast uh, on YouTube snippets so people can consume it on there but also we're going to do extra bits and pieces so keep an eye out for that we'll give you more details in the near future so andy you've got lots of there's lots of shiny buttons there's lots of things going on here you do look very very happy i must say well it, i'm uh, it's bittersweet i'm happy and i'm sad i'm happy because i've got lots of new toys i'm slightly sad because the way we used to record the podcast we use slightly different mics and actually uh, letting people behind the curtain a little we actually shared a mic so it meant that we stood a good two or three feet closer to each other <laughs> uh, so now we're, we're a bit more distant yeah but we do have to be in the same room now whereas previously we could record the podcast remotely but anyway enough of that i'm going to tell you what's on this week's show so on this week's show you will have heard about the 100 percent mortgage to be honest with you it's probably one of the biggest stories in money that i've known i've seen for quite some time a, a new product that was launched 100 percent loan to value mortgages for first-time buyers literally on the day it came out my wife came upstairs and mentioned it to me my dad texted me the first thing that everybody in the office said to me at various points everybody i saw that day even if they don't uh, gauge with money or know what i do for a living we're talking about have you seen that story about 100 percent mortgages so i am going to cover what this story is the 100 percent mortgages for first-time buyers the pros the cons and dig beneath the surface then i'm going to do a piece on investing so i regularly change my portfolio on 8020 investor so what i want to do is explain to people about having a watch list so like a short list that you use to help you make decisions it's something that i'd never really thought about in any great depth i just do these things and suddenly realize that there is a definite process that i go through when i'm making changes or thinking about making changes to a portfolio over a period of time so i want to give you some insight on that and the other topic we've been talking about a lot in the office and he's going to deal with and that's fixing energy bills that's it i'm going to do a short piece on energy bills and i want listeners really to listen out for a few key dates that i'm going to explain because people know there's the energy price cap there's also the energy price guarantee all of these things are coming into the mix in the next couple of months and they're coming to a head and so i'm going to explain what it means for consumers and whether it's going to be worth fixing in the coming months okay so let's start with the first piece on the podcast this week and it seems everyone's talking about it. 100% loan-to-value mortgages skipped and have come out with one. But there's been sort of mixed views from people. What have we got? So it's important to understand the product. So even if you are not in the market for a mortgage, you will want to listen to this because I can guarantee someone you know will be talking about this product, whether it would be your children who may be looking to get on the property ladder or somebody at work who's currently renting. So this product was launched by Skipton Building Society and it's called the Track Record Mortgage. So the clue is in the title. They've created a product that is aimed at renters to help them get onto the property market by using their track record of paying rent and utility bills on time and consistently and using that to determine how much they can borrow for a mortgage because one you've got to think a lot of people who are trying to get onto the property ladder and they're renting they may struggle to save up a deposit because their rents are high and one of the things you hear them say is i can afford my rent why can't I borrow money up to that equivalent amount in terms of their monthly payments? So if I can afford £1,500 a month in rent, why can't I get a mortgage that is £1,500 a month and therefore the equivalent amount that you can actually borrow when you scale it up? So 
It's a, a reasonable question. And what's happened is that Skipton have decided to come up with this product. And the reason it was incredibly popular is because it is unique at the moment. So I say at the moment because I do think other banks, building societies may follow suit because this isn't the first 100% mortgage. So a mortgage that requires no deposit at all. There are other ones out there. The products that exist at the moment that are the no deposit mortgages or the 100% loan to value mortgages that allow you to buy property without any deposit, they usually always require a family member or friend to put up some kind of financial guarantee. So it could be they have to put an amount of money into an, a savings account with that same institution. They earn a fixed rate of interest, but that is obviously tied in with your ability to borrow money from them. And is that money, that money has to stay there, right? So the, the parent or the guarantor can't dip into that money. That's kind of like fixed. Yeah, the aim is that it's meant to be there for the period of time. And you're helping them on the property ladder, but you are having to give up some kind of flexibility. And of course, there are other types of mortgages that have a lot more potential owners put on to the people who are helping the person onto the property ladder. So they exist, but what's happened with Skipton, they've come out with this product. So what I'm going to do is go through the features of the product so people can understand how it works. And then obviously talk about who could be eligible for it because not everyone will be. And I'm going to touch upon some of the T's and C's, the things that are in there that mean that it won't actually help as many people potentially as the headline suggests. So let's just kick off with it straight away. So it is a 100% loan to value mortgage. And the mortgage that you take out is a five year fixed deal. And the interest rate is 5.49%. Now it's for first time buyers only. And the maximum mortgage amount is £600,000. And applicants have to be able to prove that they've paid rental payments for a set period of 12 consecutive months over an 18 month period. And the mortgage doesn't have any application or compliance completion fees. And the other key thing is you can't apply for this mortgage on a new build flat. Now I have seen people talk about why is that? And they talked about cladding and all things like that. I actually believe the reason they've put that in there is because new builds always tend to have a premium on them when you buy a new build property, but particularly flats have had problems in the past. And I know this from friends who've experienced buying a new build flat on a high loan to value mortgage right in the middle of the financial crisis or just before the financial crisis in truth. And then the bottom fell out the market as a result of the financial crisis, the property prices dipped. But more importantly, the other properties in the same building hadn't been sold. So if you go to look at a flat, why would you buy a new build flat where somebody's already living in it versus the one upstairs that has been empty because they've not yet been able to sell it. So that means that people can find themselves stuck and it affects the value of that property. So that person who I know personally, their flat price obviously then dropped from what they bought it partly because of the circumstance of the situation, but also the type of property ahead. So that's one of the reasons I think they put that in there, which seems sensible. Now you have to be 21 years or older and technically you can use this product with a deposit as long as it's less than five percent but obviously the headline is that it's a hundred percent loan to value mortgage now if you've missed any late payments or any credit card payments in the last six months then you won't be eligible and you also need to fulfill a criteria called a household to household criteria now what this means is that you need to demonstrate that the household that's going to be on this new mortgage. So let's say you rent with a partner that the two of you have met the bills and the rent payments on your existing rental property. And that will therefore be allowed when you're applying for this new mortgage. And that throws up something I'm going to come back to later on, which is one of the probably downsides to this. So one of the key things when it comes to this mortgage is that the amount you can borrow is in part dictated by the current rent that you pay. So they take the average of the last six months rental payments that you've paid and you put it into a calculator on their website and they'll throw up how much you can borrow based upon that. So we'll put a link in the show notes. You can go and have a play with it if you want to. But to give you an idea, if you put in £1,600 as a monthly average rental payment, now the term of the mortgage can be up to 35 years. Now the amount you can borrow will be £298,306, so nearly £300,000. And it's important to point out that Skipton stipulate that your monthly mortgage repayments 
can't be more than the average of the last six months of your rental payments. So the calculator will tell you how much you could potentially borrow. Now, the reason I say you potentially borrow because there's still eligibility checking that's going on in the background. They're still going to assess you in terms of your income and expenditure. And then they'll use that as well to ultimately determine the amount you can borrow. It'll be the lower of the two amounts that they calculate. So it isn't just based on your rent payments, as the headline suggests, there is more to it than that. So you could be in a situation where your income, let's say joint household income, or whatever adds up to a certain amount, but actually you're paying a much higher rent, maybe you're in a particularly costly area, you might be in a situation where you were paying a lot of rent per month. But when they do the income assessment, the amount you could borrow could effectively be far less than the equivalent property that you'd ideally want. Yeah, so you won't be get the mortgage necessarily. Now, your example leads on to another one. So that is the flip side. So you could have, for example, decided to go and live in a cheaper property, pay lower rent to try and save up a deposit. Then in theory, because your rental payments are lower than what you could probably afford to stretch yourself to, then when they use your rental payment to work out the ultimate mortgage level, and then they do the assessment of your income and expenditure, because you pay very low rent, that will therefore reduce the amount that you will ultimately be able to borrow. Similarly, if you live at home with your parents, which people often do to try and save up a deposit, then it won't help those people either. And the other group of people that it's debatable how it will work, lots of people will move into shared rental so they may be shown with people they don't intend to buy with, then they similarly will have a problem with this mortgage. They will have to still demonstrate the fact that they were able to pay the bills or their share, certainly. And what you've got is if you have people where it's a shared rental property and they're going to buy a property together through this mortgage, then they've got to demonstrate their ability to pay all those bills and the mortgage together. Now, what it does throw up is another interesting example is potentially if you were a couple and you both lived in two different let's say flats that you were renting and you lived alone in each of those and you were each responsible for your own rent and your bills theoretically the two rental payments can be combined when you put it into the calculators to work out a potential amount you can borrow as a mortgage but of course then you still got to go to that affordability assessment so there are some nuances and that's why this product won't be the sort of magic bullet for everybody who wants to get on the property ladder now one of the things I want to point out is, of course, the interest rate. Now, the interest rate is, as I mentioned earlier, 5.49%, which is actually quite high when you compare to other products out there. So I want to give you some examples so people can go away and do the numbers. If you took out this product for a mortgage of £250,000, so you're buying a house for £250,000, 100% loan to value, then your monthly mortgage payments with this Skipton product would be £1,341 a month. Now I've crunched the numbers and looked at if you had a 5% deposit and a 10% deposit and shopped around in the market to get the best mortgage deal elsewhere, not with Skipton. So if you had a 5% deposit, your monthly mortgage payments would drop to £1,129 a month, which is over £200 a month cheaper. And that's because your mortgage rate drops to 4.6%. Now, if you had a 10% deposit, and again, you shopped around in the market, you could get a mortgage with a rate of 4.6%. For 2%, that's the best buy at the moment, and your monthly mortgage payments would drop to £1,053, which when you do the maths, that's almost £300 lower a month. Now, if you look at those numbers, what the Skipton product really does, it enables people to get onto the property ladder sooner, which would excite a lot of renters because it solves a, a one problem. By the end of the five-year period, what will happen is you will effectively own 5% of the property. You have repaid. This is a repayment mortgage. That's the other key thing. You'll have repaid some of your loans. So there will actually be 5% equity in the property. I'm assuming the property price remains the same. Now, this is another thing I've got to come back to. But assuming the property is still worth the same, you will have 5% equity in the property. If you'd have had a 5% deposit up front, you'd paid less a month. And 
of course, you will then, by the end of that five-year period, have about 10% equity in the property. So my point is that you can get a cheaper mortgage if you have a 5% deposit saved up and you shop around elsewhere. But there will be people who may think, well, do you know what? I just want to get the property now. And in five years time, they will effectively have a 5% stake in the property. So what it demonstrates is that there will be people who may think, oh, it'd be attractive to buy the property now with a 100% mortgage. But if you still get a 5% deposit up front, you save that first of all, then you'll be in a better position in five years time. It's a choice whether people want to get on the market now or wait. Now, what I'm going to mention now is about the negative equity part. We did negative equity last week. That was a complete fluke that we did a whole piece on negative equity. Go back and listen to that part of the podcast from last week's show that Harvey did a very good piece because we are in a market now where the Bank of England is predicting that house prices could fall 10%. The market has proved more resilient than people had thought. I've just done a video on YouTube about house prices and where they might go in the future. If house prices fall, as people are predicting, then if you pay for a property with a 100% mortgage, you are immediately going to be in negative equity. Now, the one thing I will point out about this product is because they have a five-year fixed term and it is a repayment mortgage, that does therefore reduce the potential for negative equity slightly because as I said after five years you technically will have paid off five percent of the property price so there's enough wiggle room there in effect over those five years for the property to fall five percent and you not to be yeah ex exactly affected. yeah so but that's only five percent so there is this issue with negative equity which I think is a really big concern so anybody attracted to this needs to think long and hard about whether they really want to get involved in a property with 100% loan to value. Because I know lots of people who've done that in the past and the market has fallen. And the thing is, we always talk about property prices generally about where how they rise or fall. But the UK property market is very nuanced. And so there are regions, or there were even, I think as recently as last couple of years, where I saw a presentation from somebody that was showing there were still places that were negative equity from the financial crisis, despite there being very buoyant house prices in other parts of the UK. So just because the headline numbers say house prices are going up doesn't mean house prices are going up in your area. So I do think that you have to think long and hard about taking out a product like this. It will be attractive to some people because of all the factors that I've said. If you are somebody who really can't get on the property market, you're struggling to save up a deposit, you don't have a rich mum or dad or or friend who can help you by lending you money on a deposit or be a guarantor or some financial support to get one of the other types of mortgages out there, then this will definitely be attractive to you. But go in with your eyes open. The other thing is, of course, it sounds obvious to say, but I do think people don't always realize if they are buying a property that if you're renting, then you don't have to pay all the other costs when it comes to maintaining the property. Yes, you have deposits, but you don't have to repair everything. There's lots of costs that you're going to have to now include in your budgeting if you buy a property you didn't before. So you need to factor all of that in. And so the 100% mortgage idea, I do think this has definitely got some attractions for people, but there are definite causes for concern. But there are people who also said, oh, this is like 2008 all over again. This is the financial crisis going to happen again as a result of all of this sort of seemingly, as the paper would say, excessive lending. And I don't think this is a cause for the problems in the housing market. This is a symptom of it. We are, we've got to the stage where housing is unaffordable. Yes, we've got to talk about people building more houses, etc. There are things the government needs to do. But this sort of product is being born out of the situation people find themselves in when they can afford high rents but can't get a mortgage at a lower rate. So that is one of the things about this product. But I would point out that back in 2007, I bought my first house with a 95% mortgage. And the ability to therefore move up the property ladder was helped by the fact eventually that I did buy a property even at a 95% loan to value. I would never have bought a property of 100% mortgage. Back then, they were 120% mortgages. And also back then, you could get interest only mortgages. And I deliberately only went to 95% and had a repayment mortgage because I knew that worst case scenario, I could keep paying down the debt. Yes, my mortgage payments would be higher than my friend who'd be on interest only, but it meant that I would be able to get out of negative equity eventually 
buy it time by paying down the debt, assuming that the house price doesn't go to zero, which is obviously unlikely. So that is one of the things I think is built into the product. I like it. It is a repayment mortgage, but I, I wouldn't have taken a hundred percent mortgage and I wouldn't do it now. But my point is that back then taking a higher loan to value is the only way you could get onto the property market. Now, the numbers I've given you think long and hard before you look at the product like this. There are a lot of people it won't help. I don't think as many people will be helped by this product as the newspapers first thought, but still saving up a deposit 5%, 10% in this market, as much as you can, is obviously going to be the better thing to do. But in a market that potentially could see house prices fall in, then isn't that the kind of market where a first time buyer holds far more cards than they used to? Because I know people who work in the property market, so estate agents, they're saying that what they're seeing is first time buyers are not coming to the market is not as keen as they were because they're hearing headlines saying property prices are going to fall. If property prices are going to fall, why would you rush in to buy now? You'd wait till they had fallen. So there is still that argument for waiting and saving up a deposit because it could be if prices do fall, it works in your favor anyway, and you'll be able to buy a property at a lower price with a smaller mortgage. But again, we don't know what's going to happen with house prices. Okay, interesting stuff. So if you want to read more about that, you can do so on the Money to the Masses website. We'll put a link to that on the show notes of the podcast as usual. Right, so let's move on to the next piece then. You've got an investment piece for us. Yeah, so investing. I was changing my portfolio on 8020 Investor this week. And I have a process which I tend to follow where I'm looking at uh, the funds I invest in, how the portfolio is doing. I don't always make changes month to month. I'm reviewing it as I go along. And now I touched upon this before the podcast where I talked about making fun switches. But one thing that I wanted to talk about today to labor slightly is the idea of a watch list. Now, by a watch list, what I mean is the funds or investment. So I'm looking at unit trusts. So we're talking funds here on my portfolio. But if you're looking at shares, it may be ETFs, you can still use the idea of a watch list where you can look at a range of investments, pull some down into a short list, and see how they perform with a view of making a decision. So in my process, what happens, I look at my portfolio from one month to the next, I'm looking how it's performing. And so I look at the constituents, so each fund within that, and I don't make knee jerk with uh, decisions, despite the performance might be great or poor one month to the next, because we get such quick transitions in market. So it could be that the market thinks that the Fed is going to raise interest rates further, or they're going to cut them, or that it's going to be a recession. And you can see these things happen relatively quickly. The banking crisis was a good example. So in March, we thought we were going to have a banking crisis when the market did because of the situation in regional banks in the US. We saw that quickly go through equity markets and bond markets, but we certainly saw it in equity markets in the US, UK, Europe, globally, and it had a massive impact on how funds performed. So something that could have been performing very well in the lead up to that, because bank stocks were doing very well in the lead up to mid-March. And that was because rates were going up and banks tend to perform well in a environment where rates are going up because it increases their profit margins. And you only need to look at the recent earnings reports from banks to see that that's true. And they had very good earnings reports. And despite that, their share prices still fell because of the crisis that's going on in the banking sector. The point is that you can get this change very quickly. So in one month, I would be looking at the performance of a certain fund and it may have crashed compared to other funds and be at the bottom of the relative performance table of my own funds that I hold. And then I will look at that and I'll look at why and I'll try and work out why. And I don't necessarily knee jerk and ditch that fund straight away because the short term performance can change very quickly. And I'm a long term investor. So I will look at periods much longer than that. What I will do is I will put a fund on the watch list. So I will say that next month, I'm going to make a decision about this fund if it is still in the doldrums. Or it could be I might look at the other end of the scale, it might be the fund is performing in a way that I might not want it to in terms of two funds could be performing aligned with each other suddenly, or there could be a correlation that I, that's appeared that I might not want. So it could be, for example, that bond funds are suddenly forming more like equity funds. You sometimes get that in high yield bond funds, but there may be multiple reasons. So what I will do is I will take that fund and I'll put it on the watch list, but I will state that. And what's interesting, because the way 8020 Investor works, where I have a portfolio and I give my reasonings as to why I make changes, it makes it very visual and in black and white why I do everything. And therefore I justify the decisions I make 
And the decisions could turn out to be wonderful. They could turn out to be not great. It could be that in hindsight, they ought to be better off making another decision. That's the beauty of investing. You just don't know. And I pull that up and say, look, that turned out brilliantly, that decision to switch those funds. And occasionally it doesn't always work out that way. You want to get more right than you do wrong. And so what I do is I put down why a fund might be on the watch list. And then next month when I get there, I then look at what's on the watch list and if anything else needs to go on that or come off it. And the reason that works is because it makes me accountable to the thought process that happened prior month and the process that I use when I invest and about how I choose investments, which is all via that 80-20 investor process. So it means that I have to make a decision. And if the previous month I said, right, this is on the watch list, if it's still there, I'm going to have to make a decision about getting it out of the portfolio because it's on the watch list to be removed, then that makes me have to then make a decision. Because what there is a piece of behaviors, we have behaviors investors that make us bad investors. One of them is a, a tend to put more value on the investments you currently hold than new opportunities. So you'd rather just keep the thing you've got rather than invest in something new. And so what this does by having a watch list is mean that I am more likely to ultimately will invest in a new opportunity at the expense of one that I've had that hasn't been performing. And it's based upon my decision and process about how we decide what goes on that. So you've got to have a process. The other thing is it doesn't have to be negative. It can be a positive reason. So I also track sector performance. So performance of particular assets, it could be UK equities, it could be uh, North American equities, could be gilt. And I have those on a watch list and it's part of 8020 Investor. We have a heat map that shows you for month to month the sectors that were the top performers and the ones with the bottom performers. But what that does is it means that I therefore have a watch list of sectors and how they're performing. And then potentially I'll be looking at sectors that I might need to be including in my portfolio because they're performing well or ones that are starting to cool down. A good example is commodities. So commodities performed really well up into the back end of 2022 as inflation was rising. They were a good hedge in a way against inflation. But then going to 2023, what we saw is it started to tail off and actually commodities performed relatively badly. Not every single commodity, but as a group, they largely did. And that was because obviously recession fears start to emerge. And if there's a recession, there's less demand for commodities. So you start to see this and then you realize that I need to put that sector on a watch list or look at whether I need to remove my exposure to that within my portfolio. So it doesn't have to be just the funds you have. It could be sectors or areas of the market that you want to look at. It could be things that you're just using as a watch list as a representation of particular stress or something in the market. So I use XLF, which is it's, a, it's an, actually an ETF that tracks financial stocks in the US, so the S&P 500. And it's a good indicator about the market view on the financial sector. So during the banking crisis, you saw that fall and there's certain levels that you want to look at, which I talk about in my market update, which I'll do another one of those in the next week. And they are very good at helping me decide what I'm going to keep or what I might have exposure to or use it in deciding what I'm going to do in my portfolio. In terms of your watch list then, is this a physical thing? Is it uh, an Excel spreadsheet? Is it a notepad? And you talk there about keeping an eye on things that are potentially an opportunity, but also keeping an eye on the bad ones, you know, putting the equivalent of putting your child on the naughty step. Do you separate them into good and bad? And, and where does this watch list live? Well, so it doesn't matter where you put it. It could be a spreadsheet. I mean, for what I do, because I do it live on 8020 Investor, it's actually in an article. But I, I mean, I focus more particularly on the naughty step because the data tables that I produce are almost like the, what would you call that, a good step. So I see the things that are appearing in there and I'm keeping an eye on that. That's almost like a watch list of things that are doing well according to the process that I use, the way I pick investments. So whatever your process for picking investments, you need to see and keep an eye on the ones that are ticking the boxes, even if you don't invest in them. But the naughty step, I do focus on the naughty step a lot. And I put them on there because I might want to keep an eye on their performance to see if this is something that is actually more of a change in trend rather than a, a sort of shift in sentiment, which are two different things. You can get a change in trend where there is a dynamic change in the sort of macro backdrop that's happening. So interest rates could suddenly be cut. That would have a massive shift in what would drive investment markets. So the whole macro backdrop has changed. It was a bit like the Ukraine war when that happened. That was a geopolitical event, but it had a massive impact that suddenly it shifted a lot of what happened. So things went on that list and then you'd be like, yeah, I've got to then 
take action with them. So they exist. I keep an eye on them. There are good examples where things have been on the naughty step and then you think, right, well, I'm going to get rid of them. And then the very next month, they turn out to be the best thing that you hold and they perform the best. So that is what the naughty step or the watch list is for. So make sure that you think about that. You don't always have to make a decision drastically if you change a portfolio. You can do it over a period of time, not causing you to procrastinate, but making you justify decisions that you're following a process as to why something is on the naughty step. And then you decide to take it off or replace it. And also don't forget that you can phase out of things well so if you've got investments don't have to always be i'm going out this investment i'm selling all of it i often will drip out into new investments new opportunities because that then encourages you to look elsewhere outside of your existing portfolio but i always try and tend to keep the number of holdings that i have the same so if i do that rather than me now having two holdings so a bit of the old one and something new i will inevitably probably have replaced completely an old fund or got rid of it so i tried to keep them the same because the only danger is if you over diversify then research we carried out shows that you start to almost hinder you just get lots of replication of the same thing and you might as well just end up buying a market tracker so we get to the point where i will try and keep the number of funds to a set level which is why it's important to have that list and on that point I may say I'm dripping out of this investment. That might be the decision that I make based upon them being on that watch list. I'm starting to drip out. Then the next month I come back and I complete that process because I'm starting to drip out. And I look at whether I want to continue it. If suddenly it was when I was dripping out, had an absolute turnaround in fortunes, then I might keep it. But the idea is I'm going to stick to the process and carry on. So watch list is good because it gives you a process to follow to make you make decisions that are based on some fundamentals, some objective facts rather than being reactive and subjective. Okay, so let's move on to the final piece of the podcast. Then we're going to be talking about energy prices and Cornwall Insight, who are the analysts that tend to release a lot of data and predictions around what's happening with energy in the coming months. We give them lots of coverage, don't we? They are so good. They are the best people when you're looking at anything to do with energy markets and future price moves. And and the thing is, they are good because they make these predictions. And then when it comes to fruition, they're almost bang on almost every time. So we we can actually look at what they predict with some sort of certainty that this is likely to happen. So they've produced some new estimations on where the energy price cap, and I'll explain exactly what that is, where it will be in the coming months. And it's good news for consumers. That energy price cap is going down. Now, just to briefly touch on what the energy price cap is, that's not the same as the energy price guarantee. The energy price guarantee is the government subsidy that ensures energy prices remain at a certain level, irrespective of what the energy price cap is. So the energy price cap is set by Ofgem, which is the energy regulator. It is reviewed every quarter, it used to be every six months, but they moved it to every quarter because of what was happening with the energy markets. It was all going a bit crazy. And what it does is it ensures consumers pay a maximum amount per kilowatt hour for a unit of electricity and gas. You don't need to sort of obsess about what that is. When you crunch down the numbers, it's a pence per kilowatt hour. And there's a daily stand in charge as well. So you've got to think that what used to happen in a fully functioning normal energy market we would all be paying our energy bills we could shop around we could find the best deal you could fix your energy price and we didn't think about energy price caps because energy price cap was really introduced to help consumers who didn't shop around who just stayed on the standard tariff with their provider but it wasn't until the, obviously the inflation came along and we had the ukraine war that pushed up energy prices even further that the energy price cap became the level at which everybody started paying because people realized they were better off to stay on the standard tariff but of course then that wasn't enough to help consumers because obviously that would therefore have to be increased in line when it was reviewed with the actual energy price hence the government stepped in with the energy price guarantee which they just basically subsidized all of our energy bills so that is where it all came from but this is the point it's now the energy price cap is now becoming a bit more important because energy prices have been falling yeah and so that's why it's important to bring it to the podcast today that energy price guarantee which is the government subsidy is due to change in the coming months it's actually going from two thousand five hundred pounds up to three thousand pounds just to briefly explain that figure it's a bit of an arbitrary random number really but what it is the two thousand five hundred pounds is what an average uk house household would pay for their energy over the course of the year. So you can work that out what that would be monthly. Obviously, what you pay for your energy ultimately depends on 
how much energy you use and how good you're being with Yeah, you. so the government has said, well, they weren't happy with people paying more than £2,500 a year on average. Now they're saying, we're not subsidising that anymore because we can't afford to. So do you know what? We're not helping you out until it gets to £3,000 a year. That's when this guarantee will kick in. But of course, the point is now that's not likely. Yeah. And so I mentioned Cornwall Insight at the start of this piece, and they come out with the figures and the energy price cap set by Ofgem is predicted to be capped at going forward as of the 1st of July, just over £2,000, £2,050 roughly. Now, the energy price cap at the moment is set at 3280 So we're seeing a massive shift from suddenly thinking about this energy price guarantee figure of 2,500 going up to 3,000, the energy price cap now coming down from 3,200 to 2,000. So the upshot is that if you're a consumer, given that we're now going to be talking about price caps as in the highest price you can be charged per kilowatt hour on the standard tariff is now going to mean that the average household now pays £2,200 a year. That's what you're saying that Cornwall Insight predict is going to happen soon. So that is a, a that's a big shift. And that's presumably because of the falling price of oil and commodity prices, as I mentioned in the last piece, actually. Yeah, that's right. So from the 1st of July, Cornwall Insight, I'll just pick you up on that. It's 2050 rather than 2200. But that's the figure that we're now looking at as the baseline, if you like, for your annual energy bills for the average UK household. So you've got around six weeks until these changes are likely to happen. That begs the question whether fixed price energy tariffs are going to be a thing of the future. So what we're saying to you is keep in mind energy prices are going down. Switching energy providers may be something you want to consider going forward. Keep an eye on what's happening with those energy prices. The easiest way to do that, to be honest, is to bookmark the article that we've written on the Money to the Masses website. We'll put a link to it in the show notes because as the predictions are coming through, we're going to update. We've got a lovely little image that you can see in that article that predicts the I line. would say that Andy says it's lovely because he drew it. <laughs> you created it and it is a very lovely image, but it shows you what the prediction is, doesn't it? And it so we'll, a, we'll update that. That's right. It's it's a very easy image that you can see. You can see where the lines are effectively, where the predictions are. Just be aware of, though, because this is key, that the energy price cap set by Ofgem only applies to the default standard variable tariff. It doesn't impact fixed price deals. So once you've fixed in, you're kind of going to be stuck on that. I mean, there, there were some exceptional circumstances during the energy crisis where if you fixed at a certain point, you could get out of it penalty free, but that's unlikely to happen going forward. You may have to pay a penalty. You may be stuck on that deal. So just think carefully before you switch. So I think that's a great piece. And like you say, what's likely to happen now, the idea of fixing energy bill or shopping around is likely to start to come to the fore over the summer months and the rest of 2023, if the predictions do hold true. And as we said, Cornwall Insight do have a very good track record of predicting and making accurate predictions about where these prices are headed. So great. That's it now for this week, Andy, isn't it? We are done. So I just have to say, as usual, please make sure you review the podcast. We haven't had many reviews of late, so I'm very disappointed. Keep Andy and I motivated as well as the team by going on there and giving us a glowing five star review so please make sure that you do that if you've not done it ever if you've not done it recently then do it again and write something very nice we'll likely read the best reviews out and you could win a money to the masses mug don't forget to join our facebook group facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash money to the masses and do follow us on all our social channels one last thing i will mention actually is the train strikes that happened this week we have updated our article on the compensation and refunds you're entitled to regarding single train tickets, concerts you didn't make it to, if you didn't make it to Eurovision, for example, or season tickets. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well as it's, as it's all in there. And we also shared all of that on our social channel. So I think that's it, Andy. All that's left for me is to say until next time. Until next time. Oh.